Good morning. Uh, my name is Emre Talatar. It is my pleasant duty today to introduce uh, our plenary lecturer, uh, Professor Stefan Mala. Um, I hear these days in many introductions a phrase such as uh, Mr. X needs no introduction. Uh, this applies singularly well to Stefan Mala, but a wise man had once told me that everyone uh, deserves an introduction, so he's going to get one whether he needs it or not. Uh, uh, so Professor Mala, his career has spanned uh, both sides of the Atlantic. On the other side, he was a professor in Courant. On this side of the Atlantic, he has been with the Ecole Polytechnique, not in Lausanne, in Paris. Uh, uh, and also to, to these days, he's with the Ecole Normale Supérieure in, in Paris. Um, we know him uh, as a harmonic analyst. And he has, of course, done extremely important work in uh, wavelets, in particular, uh, introducing the multi-resolution analysis with, uh, uh, with uh, Yves Mayer, uh, which is the conceptual basis of wavelet uh, analysis and construction. Um, but for a mathematician, he's someone who is uh, very close to engineers and very close to our community. He's also someone uh, who's unafraid of crossing over to the, to the real world, uh, he is, was the founder and for many years the CEO of uh, Let It Wave. I always thought it was information theory, but perhaps not. Uh, and which was, I believe, uh, some number of years ago was uh, bought out by some American uh, silicon manufacturer, Zoran Corporation, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and uh, if I understand correctly, well, uh, he's of course a, somebody who's very much interested in uh, exposition and education. I should note his book, uh, A Wave the Tour of Signal Processing, as uh, something everyone should uh, read at least parts of. And these days, I believe his interests are in uh, classification through nonlinear invariants. And I believe uh, this is the main topic of today's discussion. So I won't take too much of uh, his time. I'll let the floor to him, please. Thank you very much for this invitation and this wonderful opportunity to discuss a little bit these issues of uh, classification. So I'd like indeed uh, to make a talk about something which looks weird for many people, which are called deep neural networks. So the uh, talk I'm going to do also results from work of a uh, number of students, PhD students, Joanne Bruna, Joachim Enden, Laurent Siffre and uh, Irene Walsberger. Okay, so the classification problems, most of you know well what it is about. I'll just give an example here through a well-known databases of images called Caltech 101. It's now a relatively old database, so simple. You have about 100 classes. These are examples of classes. Anchors, Joshua Tree, Beavers, Lotus, Water Lily, and you are given number of images within each class so that you are allowed to learn. And then you are given one image and you are asked whether it's an anchor or a beaver lotus or any of these 101 classes. And when you look at the problem, you immediately realize the problem is going to be very hard because these images have considerable variability within each class. An anchor can have very different shape, can be 3D, 2D, the tree can change depending upon illumination, the growth, and so on. And one of the big difficulties to deal with this intra-class variability, and in particular, if you take two images and you just compute a Euclidean distance, obviously it will give you absolutely no information whether these images belong to the same class or not because of all these sources of variation. So one way you can see the problem is that in order to find whether uh, an image belongs to a class is to try to extract some kind of invariant structure that would belong to the class and test whether this invariant structure reveals the image or not. So in general, the way classifiers operate is that first you build a representation which of your very high dimensional data, which is here over there called phi of x, which basically tries in some sense to reduce the variability. And then you apply a classifier, for example, a simple linear classifier, which is going to basically divide 
your space with a hyperplane in order to find whether your image belongs to the class CK or let's say CL. Now what that means is that you're going to project your feature vector on a one-dimensional vector which is orthogonal to your hyperplane. So basically you are going to compute the linear combinations of your features and hopefully this is going to be essentially invariant of a CK and CL, but these invariant values hopefully are different so that you can find out whether your uh, signal belongs to one or the other class. Now, of course, the big difficulty is that you have many classes. Nowadays in ImageNet, you have about 10,000 classes, so you have to be able to find invariants which are sufficiently discriminative for any pairs of such classes. And that's the big difficulty. Building an invariant is not so hard. What is hard is to make sure that you have enough invariants and these invariants has the discriminative capability to distinguish all these possible classes. So basically the main issue is to understand how to build these representation. How to build this representation in order to have sufficient uh, invariant through these linear combinations. Okay. One way to do it, of course, is to try to extract by hand some features, but when the problem gets of very high dimension, it gets horribly complicated. Now, the kind of strategy that has been developed is to analyze the distribution of points of all the possible images that you will have in your problem and try to extract structures from that. So this is called unsupervised learning because you begin by analyzing your distribution of data without the labels. Now, here you have a big difficulty is that you are in a very large dimensional space. An image is typically a million points. You are in a space of dimension one million and you are facing this curse of dimensionality, how to build models in such high dimensional spaces. And if you look at the standard probabilistic models such as Gaussian mixture models, graphical Markov or manifold models, they all very, very strongly suffer from this curse of dimensionality. Basically, they explode when you are dealing in to such large dimension. And that's really the core of the difficulty, how to build unsupervised learning techniques. Now, there is a very interesting strategy that has been developed in the recent years under the name of deep neural networks with number of father, uh, uh, founders, Jeff Hinton, Yen Lecke, and so on. So this is the algorithmic strategy. You have your data, here the image. First you apply a series of linear operators, and then you do some kind of nonlinear pooling operation. So what does that mean? It means you take your variables and you aggregate them in some nonlinear fashion. Once you've done that, you reapply a series of non of linear operators and then reapply your pooling and then you repeat that over five, ten layers. And at the end, you're going to have a representation phi of x, which is a very highly nonlinear representation of x. And out of that, you just apply your linear discriminator and you look at your class. Now, the surprising thing is that it works incredibly well. Nowadays, they are getting basically state-of-the-art in almost all areas, computer vision, even speech, music classification, biomedical data, and so on. So how are these things trained? The problem is that you have a lot of variables. Nowadays, about more than a billion variables. So how do they learn these filtering operations? They apply a kind of compact coding strategy. They try to encode the previous layer from the, uh, sorry, the previous layer from the next layer, and the filters are the parameters to perform this encoding. And they try to do a sparse encoding of their data in one layer from the previous one. If you do that on the first layer, you get something which looks like wavelets. I'll come back to that. And they do that on each layer. And basically, what looks like is that you are building progressively more invariant representation up to the end where they observe that they get invariants which are very, very specialized, like phase detector or body detectors, which a little bit looks like the grandmother cells that have been observed uh, in the brain. And out of that, the classification seems to be very effective. Now, the question is, why does it work? How come these series of nonlinearities make sense? How come these coding strategies do make sense? 
Right now, people have a strong intuition. Very few groups are able to make these things really work. And mathematically, that remains a completely open land. Okay, that, that's what we're going to try to do. So first, I'm going to try to begin on a relatively simpler problem. I'm going to look to invariants of groups. So it will be translation groups. And in particular, we'll see that at the core of this problem is to deal with much bigger groups, which are diffeomorphism group, build environs of a deformations. And when we look at these problems, the strange thing is that we'll see that we are very naturally led to algorithmic structure which are very close to these convolution networks. Then we'll see that that leads to very different types of models of stochastic processes. And we'll look at the particular case of stationary processes first because we'll look at invariance to translation. But that will be the step to then look at the problem of unsupervised learning with these deep networks. And that's where I'll finish the talk. So let me begin with the translation problem. So if you look at a problem like digit classification here, obviously, you want to be invariant to translation, but there is something which is much more subtle. If you take a four, a four is going to be deformed, and you want to recognize the four independently from these deformations, so you want to be invariant to deformations, but not to any kind of deformations, because otherwise you are going to mix a four and a five, but only to the type of deformations of the four, for the class four. For the five, there are different types of deformations, seven, eight. So you want to be invariant to the group of translation, and you want to learn specific invariant within the diffeomorphism group. Now, you can have different types of group. For example, for images, you may want to be invariant to rotations, but rotations can also have their own deformations, so you have the diffeomorphism group within rotations. Scaling, when you see an image, of course, the distance varies, but the scaling can also vary in space because of perspectivity effects, so you also have deformation within this scaling domain. Now, if you look at speech, if you look at the standard spectrogram, this is time and frequency. Okay, I'm going to make sure you can hear. Encyclopedias. Encyclopedias. You see these two spectrograms correspond to exactly the same sound, although they are pretty different. Now, if you look at them, well, if you go from one to the other, you see that there is a deformation, both in time and in frequency. You also see that there is a translation in frequency. This is a frequency uh, transposition. So here you want to build environments to time and frequency, deformation to time and frequency, but the type of invariance, of course, depends upon the task. If your problem is to recognize this, the word, then you want to be invariant to transposition. If your problem is to recognize the locutor, whether it's a man or a, ma a woman, you don't want to be invariant to transposition. So the invariant is going to be built by the linear discriminant operator, the SVM, but your representation has to be able to prepare all what is needed in order to build these invariants. Okay, so let me come back to translation. Invariance to translation means that if you take an image such as a four, you translate it, you have an orbit in your space. This orbit should be mapped to a single point if you want to be invariant. As I said, that will be easy. However, now if you have a deformation of your four, what you want is all these elements to be mapped to a very regular manifold around this point so that then a simple orthogonal projector can build an invariant, in other words, regroups all the points in the neighborhood of your original form. Now, the difficulty, as I said, is that now if you have a different signal, such as an eight, which is translated, you want it to be invariant, but you want it to go to different points. And if you have deformations of your eight, it should be mapped in the neighborhood so that you can make a simple linear invariant and therefore easily do the discrimination. So, the problem is, first, invariant to translation. If your signal is translated, you want that the map is independent from the translation. That can be done very easily. For example, if you have two such signals, you can simply register the signal, put their center of gravity in zero, and that will be invariant to translation. You can also compute the Fourier transform. If you compute the Fourier transform, the translation is just going to change the phase. The modulus is invariant by translation. 
Okay, now what's happening if you have a deformation? A deformation means the translation now depends upon time. What's happening is that if your signal is slightly deformed, you want that your representation be close, and if the deformation is small, the deformation is basically measured by the gradient of your deformation, that's the natural metric on deformorphism. You want that the size of the distance should be of the order of the size of the deformation. This is a Lipschitz continuity property. Now, if you just do a registration, it won't work because one peak may be aligned, but the other one will not be aligned. So the distance is going to be very big, although the derivative is going to be small. If you apply the Fourier transform, it's the same because the high frequencies, if you have even a small deformation, are going to move very much and the distance is going to be big, although the deformation is small. So the question is how to get this Lipschitz stability. To get this Lipschitz stability, we are going to use wavelets, and I will explain why. So let me just briefly here summarize the key ideas for the wavelet. So a wavelet here is going to be a complex function. It has a real part, let's say, which oscillates like a cosine, imaginary part which oscillates like a sine, so it's a localized function. You take your wavelet, you dilate it by two to a j, and in frequency, this is a bandpass filter of a positive frequency. When you dilate it, you cover your different frequency bands. Then what you do is just a filter bank. There is no orthogonality. This is a very simple transform. You just make a convolution with your wavelet, so you are going to filter your signal over the different frequency bands, and you keep the low frequencies that are not covered by the wavelet. This is a wavelet transform, and it's a very redundant transform, but it can keep the norm. Okay, it's a unitary transform. You have the norm which is kept, although it's very redundant. Okay, why wavelets? First of all, observe, your wavelet dictionary, you did the inner product with translated wavelets, is environed by translation. But what is going to be very important here is that if you take a wavelet and you deform it, because it's a localized function, it looks very much like itself the distance between the wavelet and the deformed wavelet is of the order of the deformation. This is not true for a sine wave. You just dilate a little bit a sine wave, it's immediately orthogonal to itself. Another thing that will appear as important is that it provides sparse representation. We'll see where sparsity comes in uh, within this problem. So I'll show image example of our images. For images, you have a wavelet which is still a complex function. This is the cosine and the sine part you are going in 2D to rotate the wavelet also, that's a rotation, different rotation, and to scale the wavelet with 2 to a j. So now you have a family of wavelets, you do your convolution with the wavelet, you keep the low frequency, same thing, you have a unitary operator. So it works essentially like in one dimension. Okay, so now we want to build a representation which is environed by translation. If you do a convolution, Clearly, it's not environed by translation. If you translate X, the convolution with the wavelet is going to be translated. Let's do like with a Fourier transform. You have your complex wavelet transform. Let's compute the phase. Let's remove the phase. We compute the modulus. What you get is this envelope here. Now, this is a pooling in the sense of this neural net because you've taken two functions, you aggregated them in one, okay? And it's nonlinear. Now, this is not invariant by translation because if X translates, the envelopes translate. It's a little bit more invariant because you've suppressed some oscillation. If you wanted to make it more invariant by translation, there is a very simple strategy, you just average. If you average like that, you get a regular function and if the translation is small relatively to your averaging window, you have something almost invariant by translation. Now, if the averaging increase up to infinity, this is going to in converge to the integral, so you get an L1 norm. This is completely environed by translation. The problem is you've lost almost all the information. Now you just have a bunch of L1 norm, and that's very far from being able to characterize your function. So you see here this kind of trade-off, invariance and loss of information. So the question is, can we recover the information that was lost? Okay, how did we lose the information? Not by putting the modulus. What you can prove is that the modulus can be inverted because of the redundancy. It's really the averaging which kills you. 
Okay, but the averaging, that means that you've lost all the high frequencies. But the high frequencies of this function, you can recover it by computing the wavelet coefficient of this function. So that means you are computing the wavelet transform of this wavelet function. However, these coefficients are not invariant to translation. How can you make them invariant by translation? Same strategy. You kill the phase, and then you average. Now observe, you have much more invariant now. You don't just have invariant for all scales lambda one, but for any pair of scale lambda one, lambda two. But again, you've lost information. How can you recover this information? Repeat the same thing. So that will be the strategy. And here, we are just arriving to a deep neural network. You begin from X, you apply your wavelet transform. So first invariant, the average, and all the wavelet coefficients. Now you reapply a wavelet transform. Now you get your, sec your new invariants and the next layer of wavelet coefficients. Now you reapply a wavelet transform and the modulus. You get your next layer of invariant and the next layer of coefficients, and so on. Oops, so that's the process. And these are all the coefficients. First average, the average of the wavelet coefficient of the wavelet of the wavelet of the wavelet, and so on. You have this whole series, very, very big vectors of environment. So now the question is, what's the property of these things? Does this new environment provide you any information? So let me begin with examples before showing the, the map. This is an example of audio signal. The four are different, okay? There is an attack, a tremolo, a vibrato. If you look at the average of the wavelet coefficient, they look essentially the same because you've lost the information by averaging. You've lost a subtle difference. If you look at the second order coefficient, which are basically measuring the variation of the wavelet coefficients, you see appearing the high strong attack with high frequency coefficients here. You see appearing the tremolo here and the vibrato over there. So you see that these second order coefficients are very important in terms of info information. In audio processing, that's very much related to the so-called modulation spectrum. Okay, so we built the representation by cascading a unitary operator, a modulus. The modulus is contractive, so this is a contractive operator. Then we applied a new contractive operator, new contractive operator. If you cascade contractive operators, you are going to get a contractive operator globally. The other very important property that you can prove is that the energy of the last layer is progressively going to converge to zero. Why? Because each modulus pushes your energy to the low frequency. You've seen, you got a nice envelope when you compute the modulus. So progressively, all the energy of the signal in a nonlinear way is going to be pushed to low frequency so everything is going to be transformed into an environment representation. And that's what your theorem tells you. First of all, your big vector here, if you apply a simple Euclidean norm, is a contractive operator because it was built as a cascade of contractive operator. So the distance is smaller than the distance between x minus y. Second thing, the whole norm of this is equal to the norm of x. All the energy got out through these invariants. Third thing, probably the most important, you are now stable to deformation. If you have a signal which is deformed, if you looked at the distance between the repre scattering representation of X and the scattering representation of X deformed, it's going to be of the order of the gradient of the deformation. Why? Because the wavelet have separated the different scales and almost commute with your deformation. And that's why here wavelets are absolutely key. Okay, once you have that, now you can hope to do classification. You have your invariant, you are stable to your deformation. You should be able to solve some of the classification problems. We are going here, just for illustration, to use a very simple classifier, not an SVM, which just takes all your data, you have the red class, the blue class, you transform it in your scattering domain, and in the scattering domain, because normally your deformation are now linearized, you should be able to approximate each class with a simple affine space.
So you are going to compute this affine space with a simple PCA. You take your signal X, send it in your representation domain, and then just find the affine space, which is the closest, that will correspond to your class. Very simple. If you apply that to digit recognition, that's the work of Joanne Brunard, basically you get the state of the art. So there is a very well-known database which is called MNIST, put together by Yann Lequin. And what you do in this case, you build your representation, apply an SVM or this simple uh, uh, PCA representation. The state of the art was up to now obtained with these convolution nets. If you apply this with just one layer of invariant, you don't do as well. The error is about 0.7%. If you apply two layers of invariant, you get 0.4%. Now, how does that compare to these uh, uh, neural nets where you learn everything? It's a bit better, but it's because it's an ideal problem for us. Why? Because the only source of variability are translation and deformation. So you don't need to learn them. And if you know the source of variability in the group, then you know that the best you can do are basically wavelets. You don't need to learn them. So in some sense here, we are cheating because we are choosing the ideal problems for us. The difficult problem is when you don't know exactly the source of variability. Okay, now let me go to stochastic processes. If you look, if you take a stationary process, X, and you transform with this transform your stationary process, what are you doing? You're doing just a series of convolutions. So if you take a stationary process, you convolve it, you still have a stationary process. Take the modulus, it remains stationary. Now, at the end, you average. So hopefully, when you are averaging, it's, you are getting an estimator of the expected value of x, of x convolved with psi 1, and so on. So in some sense, you can view that as an estimation of an expected scattering transform which carries all these expected values. That's the representation that we're now going to study. This representation is now a representation of the stationary processes through these expected value in the same way that the power spectrum is a representation of stationary process through expected value of modulus of Fourier coefficients. Okay, what's the properties? And that goes essentially through the same kind of proof in the deterministic case. Because it is obtained through a cascade of contractive operator, it is contractive. The expected scattering transform between two processes, the distance, Euclidean distance of this deterministic vector is smaller than the expected value of the difference. It conserves the energy. You have exactly the same kind of Parseval theorem than for the Fourier spectrum. The total variance is recovered by the Euclidean norm of your vector. However, what you have and that you don't have with a Fourier spectrum, again, is stability to deformorphism. If your random process is deformed by a stationary process tau, then the distance between the two representations is going to be of the order of the maximum value taken by the gradient of tau. Let me show you examples. These are two textures, stationary textures. Completely different, but they have exactly the same second order moment. That means that they have exactly the same power spectrum. The first order scattering coefficients are essentially the same because they essentially depend upon second order moments. They are like averages of the Fourier spectrum. If you look at the second order coefficient, they are totally different. They are totally different because this is much more sparse than this within the wavelet coefficients. In some sense, the second and higher order scattering coefficient, first of all, depend upon high order uh, moments and reveals the geometrical distributions of the singularities within the image. Let's take the case of a sound. You see, these two sound textures are very different. They are both stationary. They have exactly the same power spectrum. First order coefficient, they are the same. Second order coefficient, you see appearing these coefficients which are very different because of this type of random oscillations here, which don't exist over there. Okay, so I'm saying this is providing a representation of uh, stationary processes. In what sense? Well, if you take all these expected values, these are expected values of very nonlinear functionals of your random process X that was obtained through your neural network or your scattering transform. 
Now, if you try to recover a maximum entropy distribution, which means you try to recover the distribution which satisfy these expected value, but which maximize the entropy, if you apply the Boltzmann theorem, you know that it's going to be, have a Gibbs energy, which is a linear combination of these nonlinear functionals. If you do that, you can resynthesize examples. So these are examples on sounds. I'm going to make you listen to sounds. The Gaussian models, so obtained by all the covariance coefficients, or power spectrum, n coefficients, and with a scattering coefficient which are only log n squared coefficients. When you look at, hear the scattering models, you can hear that the transient structures are restored. You'll see the Gaussian model. You always have the same shh with, of course, a spectrum which is adapted. So you see that with these very few coefficients, you are able to restore a lot of structures, and that should be useful for characterizing textures. So if you do texture classification out of that, so there are very standard databases of textures. This is one that was put together by Malik at uh, Berkeley, and that's the work of Joanne Brunat. So what you just do is the same thing. You build the scattering representation of these textures. You build a model with either a PCA or a linear SVM, and out of this model now you take a new texture and you do the classification. The state of the art is basically obtained with Fourier spectrum. People have tried all kinds of feature histograms and so on, but never really got anything better than Fourier spectrum if you do well the Fourier spectrum. The error of the Fourier spectrum is of the order of one person. Where are these errors? These errors correspond to images having exactly the same covariance properties. If you apply the scattering transform here, the error drops to 0.2 percent. So there is a very dramatic uh, decrease. Now, does that mean that any process is better characterized by that kind of scattering representation than Fourier? The answer is no, of course. If you have a very narrow uh, frequency structures, Fourier will be better. But if you take images which are very wideband images, then in all the databases we got, and there are many of them, the scattering transform was doing much better because of this stability to deformations, I'll come back to that, and this ability to get basically better the geometrical distributions. Okay, let me now go to other type of invariants. Suppose now you want to be invariant to transposition. So, as I said, man, woman, there is going to be a transposition effect that you don't care about if you want to recognize the words. So you want basically to be invariant now to a translation across frequency and also potentially to deformation through these translations. So the idea here is you just do a scattering transform along time and then a scattering transform along frequency, along translation of this log frequency parameter. If you do this kind of thing, I'm just going to show how the invariants progressively improve classification. This is a task of classification of musical genre. So you can, may have rock and roll, classic music, jazz, blues, and so on. Your problem, you're given a, a, a music, you have to recognize the type of music it is. If you do that out of MFCC, which are the standard representation, which essentially correspond to the first layer of invariant of the scattering coefficient, you get an error of about 20%, which you get in the same way with a scattering transform with only one layer. If you add a second layer, so this kind of modulation spectrum coefficients, you get about 12 percent errors, so there is a dramatic decrease. And then if you add the invariance to frequency shift, you get 2 percent more uh, improvements. What about images? So images, the kind of invariance you would like to get are invariant to rotation scaling. So let's look at rotation. The rotation, translation rotation group, so that's now just rigid motions, are defined by rotation matrix and the translation. Okay, you translate and you rotate your image. Now this is a non-commutative group. You can average, you can get something which is invariant to rotation and translation by just averaging. You just average over all possible translation 
and all possible rotation. That means you are going to average over your translation rotation group relatively to all rotation and all translation. That's the averaging filter. You get an invariant, but it's like for translation. You are going to lose too much information. How can you recover the lost information? High frequencies. How are you going to get the high frequencies? Wavelets. So you get a wavelet transform on the group, and that's the kind of thing that uh, people know how to build, so that's not a problem, by convolving to convolution on the group relatively to your wavelengths. So here is the structure. You have your signal. Now you put your environment relatively to translation. But now you consider your image at the output not just a function of translation, but translation rotation. And now you want to make an environment relatively to that. So now you're going to make a wavelet transform relatively to these two parameters by making a convolution on the group and the averaging, and you get your rototranslation invariant. What if you want to make an environment to scale? Now you consider that as a function of translation, rotation, scale, and you make a, a convolution on the rototranslation scaling group, and you get your invariant. Now observe, instead of now putting together only the point in time, you put together the point in time and rotation. So you begin to filter in a much more complex way your whole layer of coefficients. So here are images. This is a database which is much more complex because there are much more variability. Rotation, translation, it's a database of textures, standard one, and deformations. If you just make an environment to translation, you get about 20% error because you have too much variability remaining and your SVM, a linear invariant, will not be able to cope with it. If you add more invariant, invariant to rotation, you drop to 2%. If you drop, you add invariant to scaling, you drop to 0.6%. So you can see how when you progressively adapt the invariant, your classification task gets better, better, and better. But the problem is, when you have a complicated problem, you are not given in advance this invariant. If you want to recognize chairs from cars, there is a huge variability between the different type of chairs, and you don't know the group of chairs if this group exists, so you have to learn it. And that's where unsupervised learning comes in. So to look at the problem of unsupervised learning, we're going to go back to all this and relax all the constraints. Instead of saying I have a wavelet transform, I'm just going to suppose that I have a redundant but unitary operator which preserves the norm, which goes in the complex domain, but the size of this CNM plus one may be much bigger. It can be a redundant transform. And we're going to do the same thing. I'm going to take a random process, which is the set of all my possible data in the world, and I'm going to iterate. Each time I'm going to compute the expected value, transform it with this unitary operator, take the modulus. This is this nonlinear pooling, which is the contractive aspect, very important. So you begin with X, compute the expected value, center your process, transform it, modulus. You get X1. Same thing, expected value, center it, transform it, very redundant, modulus X2. So that's my first layer, second layer, third layer, and so on of my neural net. These are the output. The output are all these expected value. This is a scattering transform. Now this is a representation of the probability density of the original process, which is a very high dimensional process. So here we are building representation of very high dimensional processes. First property, because you've cascaded again contractive operator, it's contractive. Second property, you conserve energy. You have a Parseval uh, uh, formula because each of them conserve energy and you can prove that this is at the end going to converge to zero, so all the energy is going to get out. You have a conservation of energy. The question is how to learn these things? What, what sense does that mean to learn these things? What should be the criteria? The idea is the following. You are doing contraction. What you want is to avoid to collapse two points of your data set which may belong to different classes. So you don't want to contract your data. You want to contract the space but to preserve the data. So you are going to build operators which are contracting the space but which don't contract the data which is shown in blue. 
which preserve the data as much as possible. So that at the end, if you renormalize, everything essentially corresponds to the space occupied by the data so that classification will be much easier then. Now, there is one simple observation. If you look at the volume reduction when you go from one layer to the other, so the reduction of variance, it's exactly equal to the energy of the scattering coefficient. So what you want is to learn these operators so that there is as little scattering coefficient energy going out at each layer. For each m, you want to minimize that. So what does it mean? This is your iteration. This is your centered process. The next operator is going to be learned so that this coefficient is as small as possible. So this operator should be learned so that this has a small expected value. This is positive. The expected value is like an L1 norm. You are minimizing an L1 norm. What does that mean? That means that this is building a sparse representation of this centered process. And that's what you want to do at each stage. This should be doing a sparse representation. Now, this is the centered process. You're going to find a second operator which builds a sparse representation, and so on. That's exactly what these people are doing in these deep neural nets. They are learning by sparsifying each time. And by doing that, they are basically obtaining a representation which doesn't collapse their data, but which collapses the space. And at the end, you are getting a beautiful representation of your very high dimensional rep uh, representation. Each time, you are building the sparse representation. OK. How does that relate to sparse, to, sorry, supervised classification? Now you are given a data X, and what you want is to classify X. So these only depend upon the signal of the world. They provide you no information for classification because your class is a subset of all the signals of the world, and you want to know which subset it is. So you are going to try transform x, and the representation of the x is going to be obtained at the end, okay? It's going to be given by the transformation, successive transformation. Now, this last layer, if you renormalize it, essentially all the signal of the world occupies all the space. And now you want to do uh, an SVM representation, basically split this space in two, hopefully separating class one from class two. What does it mean that you split this space in two? That means that you're doing a linear combination of this function un that way, which is a linear linear combination. Now, what do you hope? Is that this function f of x is able to represent the indicator function of the frontier which separates the two classes. And here, basically, you have a functional approximation problem in very high dimensions. Now, there, there are very interesting structures that these functions have that we are currently studying, but these are basically completely open problems at that stage. So, what I just wanted to show through uh, this lecture is that these very strange deep networks, which are now being studied by literally hundreds and hundreds of engineers, they are uh, big companies such as Google now have a team of 15 people only working on that. It's now spread in number of their products. IBM is using that for speech processing. Microsoft and so on. Big companies are now using that. It does work. There is currently very little mathematical work on it, and it's a problem. It's a problem because basically only the very highly skilled engineers are able to understand how these things work. I do very strongly believe that there is a lot of structure, and more than that, my impression is that it gives a completely different approach to this very fundamental problem, which is representation of probability distribution in very high dimension. And I believe that's also at the core of some of the problems that are uh, being studied in information theory. And the key idea here is in order to represent this distribution is to represent them through contraction. In the case of, uh, for example, Gaussian mixture models, you try to, to cover basically your distribution through blobs, which are these Gaussian uh, 
uh, distribution. Here, it's a completely different strategy. Uh, well, for the case of Markov or, or the, the problems of uh, uh, Markov or manifold or graphical models is you need to have a notion of neighborhood. Now, in very high dimension, it's very hard. So here, by doing this contraction, progressively, you are finding out the domain where this distribution is living. And the way I see these unsupervised learning is through this optimization of contractions. So wavelets works beautifully as long as you have a group structure, and basically, you build your wavelet transform on the group. When you don't have a group structure, I have a tendency to believe that it still looks like multi-scale structure over your data, but that's really a conjecture. And as I say, there is a lot of work to be done. So we do have some work that is available, and thanks very much. Thank you very much indeed for a beautiful lecture. There is lots of time for questions. Yes. Do you see any connection between error correction, coding, so, decoding, so etc., and learning? Sorry, I didn't understand. I didn't think in these terms, error correction coding. The thing is, one of the specificity of classification, it's about losing information. Uh, when, when you do classification, you are here to try to remove as much information which is not available, which is not useful. And in some sense, it's, it's very different from coding in these terms. When you are doing coding, and in particular, and uh, error corrections, but maybe error correction may be a little bit different. But the, the big differences, let's say, with coding is that, and with inverse problems, denoising, all these low-level signal processing problems, is that you are not interested in restoring the signal per se. Uh, and uh, you are interested, as I said, in removing information so the framework is a little bit different, and I don't see uh, indeed uh, any close connection with uh, error, con uh, uh, error cor uh, correction, but maybe, uh, I mean, I must say I haven't thought about it. Yes. So many examples are going down to two levels. Have you tried deeper levels, three, four, and so on? Okay, so the reason why in you know, all what I showed there was only two levels is because I was only dealing with invariants on groups, translation, rotations, and so on, so that was enough. And I was precisely not dealing with very complex problems like the Caltech 101 or so on where you distinguish cars and so on. People who are doing that are using five, 10, even now about 20 levels. I don't know whether 20 is useful, but they are using much more because in the next levels, they are applying that kind of learning strategy where they're learning the specific structures of chairs, cars, and the environments associated to it. So I just stopped after two because in my case, the type of environments I needed I got them out of two layers or three layers. So it's just a consequence of the fact that I'm dealing with classification problems here, textures, digits, and so on, that are somewhat simpler than what I showed on the first slides. But practitioners use much more levels. Classification, say other boost. Uh, how you compare all these algorithms? See that which one is okay. The, I think that there is two things one uh, needs to distinguish. There is one the construction of the representation. Then there is the classifier uh, uh, per se. Now uh, the other boost 
is a way to aggregate weak uh, classifiers. And in some sense, it's the kind of thing that you can put on top of this representation. Each, if you look at what such a representation provides you, this phi of x, each coefficient of phi of x is a very weak information. In order to build a classifier out of that, you need to regroup these very weak information, and that's what an SVM would do, but an ad, uh, uh, a boosting strategy could, uh, could also do it. So all these uh, learning techniques can be applied. In some sense here, I was separating uh, the kernel building from the effective uh, classifications, and, but you're right, there are much more sophisticated things that could be done than just applying a linear discriminator directly. Um, in your example of a digit classification, you mentioned that uh, if we deform uh, digit four too much, then it may become five. So do you expect the linear discriminator to deal with this uh, li limiting deformation or you have some uh, particular parameter uh, in the wavelet to limit the degree of uh, deformation? I, I'm sorry, you said, I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand. So you mentioned an example of digit classification in the uh, MNIPS uh, data set yes. that if, you, uh, if we deform digit four too much, then it may become digit five. Yes. But, uh, uh, but translation always works. Yeah. So do you, how do you limit the degree of deformation? Okay. Uh, do you expect the linear discriminator to deal with that or do you have some special parameters? Yes, so that's very important. The idea is that the invariant is normally not built in the representation. Translation is a very particular case. The invariant is built by the linear combination of the linear discriminator. The representation is just providing you the building blocks so that you can build an invariant which is informative. Now in this case, what the linear uh, discriminator is doing is for each class, trying to see exactly the kind of environment it can build. In other words, what are the type of deformation of the four, the type of deformation of the five that you can deal, that you can uh, kill. So it's the linear discriminator which learns the deformation and the invariant of this deformation. It would be much too risky to build the invariant to deformation in the original representation because in fact your problem may be recognize the way someone writes. And uh, you, if you want to, to recognize a handwriting, you are not interested in the four or whether it's a five, but the way you are doing the four. So you don't want to have any invariant to deformations. So again, the specific invariant is built by the linear discriminator. You just provide enough building blocks to have any possible interesting invariants. And that's why this representation gets absolutely huge. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, sort of the robustness of these approaches to noise? It seems like in all of your examples, for example, you had a really clean audio signal or images that were fairly clean. I mean, undergoing sort of rotations and translations and such, but how about if there was actually some signal loss, like the images were blurred in some way, or there was sort of background noise in the actual audio signal? Um, can these techniques sort of handle that as well? Okay, so the notion of noise in classification is, uh, is a bit complex. Either you consider noise as being an additive noise, like white noise, and here you have L2 stability. You have a contractive operator, the fact that the distance is smaller than the distance of the original signal, that provides you stability to L2 or to L2 additive noise. But then the problem is, what if the noise is in the deformations or uh, that kind of thing? And that's where, again, stability comes in. The Lipschitz uh, uh, stability uh, comes in. Now, what if you have several conversations and you want to listen to one conversation? And that's a problem of source separation which is very important in these type of problems, but it's already a classification problem. 
So uh, in terms of pure uh, additive white noise or noise on the parameters, this kind of approach is exactly about first privileging stability. So Lipschitz continuity, contractivity, and then so you get this kind of stability. Uh, there has been a, a lot of work recently on uh, learning sparse dictionaries. And uh, how does what you present compare with uh, sparse dictionaries uh, techniques? Okay, so what I showed at the end was that these operators was precisely sparsifying the signal. This operator, you can view it also as a dictionary. An operator or a dictionary, it's two ways to see the same thing. So it's exactly about building dictionaries which are sparsifying the data. However, uh, so I've been working a lot on uh, dictionaries and uh, these matching pursuit, how to sparsify, but I, uh, Initially, I was very enthusiastic, but that was in the 90s, thinking if you sparsify the data, problem solved, because you now have a low parameter, few parameters to deal with, classification is easy. That perspective is wrong. That, sorry, that perspective is wrong. It's wrong because when you just sparsify your data, you also build in a lot of variability, and in fact, the classification much, must be much more, can be much more complicated. So I was, very much wondering why sparsity is so important. And obviously sparsity is very important because we see it in all the algorithm and it does work. So in some sense, what I'm proposing here as an explanation of why sparsity is important is because when you build up sparsity, it's a way to isolate the space of data from the space of the rest. But the representation that you get at the end, phi of x, is not really sparse. It can have many coefficients, but your space of data, which was sparse in the original representation, is completely separated. So the short answer to what your, your question is, dictionary learning is at the core of these things, to learn the different layers. And the role of sparsity is a bit subtle, but it's really important. Results from homology will be applicable to classification for certain problems, perhaps, and deformations that you may have in certain cases. That I can't answer. Like, I... Uh, you know, having eight that you mentioned here, it can be deformed in different ways, and homology, perhaps. You know. Now, the big difficulty in these techniques is to make sure that you're stable. You see, uh, for example, there was a lot of topological approaches, let's say an eight is intrinsically different from a nine because there's two holes. Yeah, but it's very easy to make an eight and to have a little bit of gap so that your loop is not closed. Is it now equivalent to a nine? Not really, because it's almost an eight. And that's the problem of, complete, of topological approaches is that you have to build in stability. And very often this kind of approach lacks this type of stability, or maybe it's a challenge, how to build in stability with this type of approaches. I have one last question, which I believe is there. Uh, so the examples that you've shown are very nice and uh, constructive in that uh, you build a system around the uh, robustness that you want, for example, against translations, rotations, and whatnot. How does one develop the faith that repeating this procedure in more layers or uh, making it more deep would get to the robustness that is required to, let's say, get to chairs, kids play, cars, etc.? Okay, so that's the idea of these deep networks is that as you go deeper and deeper, it's not, at the beginning you deal with small structures like letters and so on, and then the next layer hierarchically aggregates these structures and so that you basically build models of chairs, cars, and so on. If you look at the kind of uh, deep networks that Hint, Hinton is, is building and all these groups at Google's with uh, over a billion parameters, they are doing recognition of incredibly complex images, 
with cars and people and so on the, within it. Because these next layers build these aggregations. What is interesting when you think, for example, that, that's a debate on reading. Are you reading letters? Are you, are you reading directly words? And in some sense, what these networks propose is that then you aggregate the letters and so on, and at the last layer, you, almost, you directly have the model, in some sense, of the words directly. So that's the idea which is behind. The fact, and that's, uh, but the, the math of the next layers is very general, by saying we have uh, general uh, uh, unitary operators, not specific enough. We, there is no real results on the kind of structure you are able to characterize with these layers. Experimentally, it, it seems to work on the type of examples that you mentioned. With that, I would like to thank once more Stefan Mara for a wonderful Thank you. Time.